Jesus' ministry began along this Galilean shoreline in the shadow of the mountains you can see behind me, but it would lead eventually to the division of history into BC and AD. That's next on Israel, the prophetic connection. Much of Jesus' ministry, the miracles that he did, occurred in the communities around the Sea of Galilee. And of course, his story is told in the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are also the panoramic visions of the future that occur in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, that was given to the Apostle John by the risen Christ. And here and there in other books in the New Testament, we get glimpses of Jesus. But his story is told again in the book of Hebrews. Surprisingly, the author does not name himself. Who was this mysterious writer that wrote the book of Hebrews and made all those prophetic linkages between the Old Testament and the New? Perhaps there are clues to his identity on the very pages of the book of Hebrews. But who was this mysterious writer with the ability to connect the prophetic dots between the Old and New Testaments? It's quite interesting that the book of Hebrews, we actually don't know who the author was. He didn't pen his name to it. Why did that happen is a very great mystery. When reading the book of Hebrews, we understand that the Apostle Paul's doctrine, his foundational teachings are very succinct, very clearly in the style of what we read in Hebrews. But the type of language, the way it was written, is actually kind of a notch above in quality, in style, in poetic uh, expression. Well, it, it is kind of a mystery why the author didn't sign his name. And uh, scholars have puzzled over this for centuries and centuries. Um, clearly, um, he, I believe he was someone that they knew. And uh, he's writing as a Messianic Jew to Messianic Jews. Um, some of the mysterious things are the style of the Greek writing and the fact that Timothy has been imprisoned and is being released, which is not mentioned in uh, Paul's previous uh, letters. So this is, must have been a, a later occurrence. But uh, we don't know who, who wrote uh, Hebrews. Could have been Paul, could have been Apollos, maybe Barnabas, but definitely someone of apostolic stature someone who really knew what was going on, someone who understood the Hebrew mind, who I know really has a deep grasp of the scriptures and the theological issues of the day. But how does God speak to us in the 21st century? God continues to speak to us through the scriptures. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. The God also speaks through present day prophets, just as he spoke to the prophets of old. God is still speaking by His Holy Spirit through men and women who are dedicated to Him and who have their ears open to what the Spirit is saying. Well, God speaks to our world today in exactly the way the writer to the Hebrews says. He's speaking to us through His Son. And in Jesus, we see the perfection of the Mosaic law and the prophets and all that had come before. And He is the, the exact characteristics of the Father. He's the, the radiance of His glory and the, the, the perfect image of the Father. And so and now we're being called to understand God's will for every person really through the image of His Son. And um, this is the point and the, I think the most powerful point really that the writer to the Hebrews makes right at the very beginning. But why does the writer begin with such a strong declaration about the Son of God? I believe this letter starts with a strong declaration about Jesus as the Son of God because he's writing to uh, Jewish believers and he's really emphasizing that this is the great new revelation that God has given. One of the most interesting things I see in this is that it's a, the right way to portray Jesus to Jews then and even now. 
Uh, so many Christians, when they're trying to share faith with Jewish people, will say, Jesus is God, and it causes a misunderstanding because Jews think, well, your Jesus has taken the place of our God, where the writer to the Hebrews makes it clear, the Son does not take the place of the Father, but He is the exact representation of the Father. And I think this is a really important point for Jewish people. But wouldn't this message about Jesus being the Son of God have been too extreme, too difficult for most Jews to accept then and now? The writer to the Hebrews emphasizes that Jesus is the Son of God. That would be a radical thought to the Jewish people of his day. In fact, whenever Jesus was referred to as the Son of God or implied that he was the Son of God, they came against him and called him a blasphemer. But the writer to the book of Hebrews says he is the Son of God, and here's why, and he is superior to anyone who's ever come before him, whether they be human or angels. He is the great and mighty Son of God from heaven. It's really the way to portray Jesus to Jewish people. Uh, when so many Christians share their faith with Jews, they, they often say, well, Jesus is God. And to the Jewish person, that means that Jesus has taken the place of the Father. And I believe the writer to the Hebrews makes it really clear that Jesus never usurped the place of the Father, but instead is the exact representation of the Father's nature. And I believe this is the correct way to portray him to Jewish people. Uh, he brings us to the Father. And I believe this is the heart of Jesus throughout his ministry. Whoever wrote the book of Hebrews was clearly a follower of Jesus. Not only that, his ability to connect the prophetic dots between Christian and Jewish belief systems show that before he became a Christian, he was first of all a Jew. But now, because of his writing, we also know he was a Messianic Jew with an urgent message for his Jewish friends. Don't go away. After this short break, Dr. John Tweedy returns with his teaching. Mayor Panim is one of the charities that Sea Fry America supports. Providing food and care through soup kitchens throughout the land of Israel, Mayor Panim has become a critical source for the most vulnerable. Yet the needs in many communities like Demona are rising. With the recent closure of two other soup kitchens in Demona, Mayor Panim must now expand to care for more people who are in desperate need. The demand on us has increased by at least 30% over the last year. Thanks to C4I's assistance, we are now going to expand the center and expand the amount of meals which will be going out every day. That is a C4I project and we're very, very grateful. Your giving makes a difference in the lives of Israel's most needy. Please help C4I, help Mayor Panim, help people in Dimona. Call or write today and partner with us with a gift of just $20 or more and show the people of Israel that you care. We're waiting to hear from you. As we begin our in-depth study of prophetic connections in the New Testament book of Hebrews, we need to understand that in its beginnings, Christianity was viewed as a thoroughly Jewish sect. For example, Jesus was a Jew. His first disciples were Jews, Galilean fishermen, and behind me, the Sea of Galilee. Most, if not all, of the early converts to Christianity, the ways of the Christ, were Jewish as well. And they practiced Jewish traditions. They kept the law. And you would have found Jesus in various synagogues on the Sabbath day, worshiping along with the other men, the other Jewish men of Israel. Now, obviously, the writer of Hebrews understands all of this, but his goal is to show, and in fact, particularly his Hebrew Jewish audience, his goal is to show them through his letter that Christ is all sufficient and supreme. And he does it by comparing Christ with Old Testament traditions, with the Old Testament priesthood. Um, he, he says that Christ was greater than Moses, greater than the angels, um, greater than Abraham and so many others. And then he, at the very opening statement of the book of Hebrews, he begins with these words. And here is a comparison between how God spoke in the past through the prophets of Israel, but how he now speaks through 
his own son, Jesus of Nazareth. Listen to this incredible beginning to this letter, which is a declaration of the supremacy of Christ in verse one. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, meaning to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the others, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, meaning of God the Father, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, that means by the cross, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And people in biblical times revered the idea of angels because the Old Testament is full of uh, the appearances of angels at various times. And so they were revered. In fact, probably in the Jewish mindset of the first century, um, angels acted as intermediaries between God and men. And so they, they had very high status. And the writer will go on to show that Jesus is superior to the angels as well. Now, um, the question is, who wrote this mysterious book? Or in fact, who is the mysterious writer of this incredible um, story of Christianity, uh, the way it's explained? Who was it? And that's been an ongoing debate down through the centuries. But for me, the Apostle Paul is the author. And I'll, I'll show that as we move through episode by episode, chapter by chapter. But it seems the reasoning sounds very much like Paul. And if it wasn't Paul, it was someone with the same intellectual ability as Paul, the knowledge of the Old Testament, the training, um, someone who could put together uh, these prophetic connections, who thoroughly understood the Old Testament, but even as early as this in the first century, could piece together the doctrines of Christianity and understand the ways of the Christian versus the ways of Old Testament uh, tradition. So, I mean, if Paul wrote this letter, then why not sign it? Well, remember who Paul was. Before he was Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was a Roman citizen, but he was also Jewish. And as we read in the, in the especially in the book of Acts, we find that this Saul was very well connected with the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem. He was on, um, probably on first name basis with the high priests of Israel. And we find him in Acts chapter 9, in the Acts of the Apostles, on his way to Damascus. But in fact, even earlier than that, he was a witness, if not the supervisor, of the stoning of Stephen, the first recorded Christian martyr in Scripture. And right after that, he's on his way to Damascus in Syria. He has letters of authority from the high priest in Jerusalem to go to Damascus, and if he finds any of this way, these Christians, to bring them bound in chains back to Jerusalem. So he's actually, he's reaching out beyond the borders of Israel to try to stamp out Christianity, thinking he's doing God's will and the bidding of the religious authorities in Jerusalem. But on his way to Damascus, it's recorded in Acts chapter 9, he has an encounter with the risen Christ that dramatically changes, forever changes his life, and he becomes then the greatest apologist of the Christian faith. We revere the Apostle Paul, but the mindset of the Jewish people of that day, Paul was the greatest traitor that Israel had ever had because he turned and became a Christian. And in the mindset of the Jewish people, in fact, then and now, one cannot be a Christian and at the same time, a faithful Jew. So they would have seen Paul as a turncoat, uh, a traitor. And so um, while he signed his name to 13 other New Testament letters, if he wrote this one, he dare not sign his name to it because his readers would not have even read the first verse that they knew this was Paul's letter. Now, there are <clears throat> other reasons for thinking that Paul is, is the author of this letter. We know that, for example, um, 
more than 100 ancient writers between AD 70, when the, the temple was destroyed, and 730 AD, a span of almost 700 years, 100 writers believed that Paul wrote the letter to the Hebrews. He was recognized as the author by early church councils, and they accepted the fact that he wrote this letter. A certain ancient manuscripts have Paul as the author of Hebrews. So there are many reasons to believe um, that Paul wrote the letter, but I see other things in the tone, um, in the style, in, in the references that are given, uh, and reflections of, of Paul that I see in other New Testament letters that we definitely know he wrote because his name is um, attached to them. The Apostle Peter also refers to a letter that Paul wrote. Uh, he mentions it in his second letter in the New Testament, in 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. Um, he actually sets it up this way, and beginning in verse 14, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. Now, was Peter making a reference to the letter to the Hebrews? Because then he goes on to say, as also in all his epistles. So there's a distinction being made. There is something that Paul wrote that Peter is referencing, but it is in addition to all his epistles. And it could very well be that he's alluding to the Paul's letter to the Hebrews. Um, speaking in them of these things in which some are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So here Peter is issuing the same kind of a warning the writer of Hebrews issues, that people can twist the scriptures or they can bring to bear the traditions again and pull Christians back in under the law and instead of the freedom they've already found in Christ. I also find a strong clue that Paul was the author at the very end of the letter itself. Um, I'll explain it this way. It's in the benediction, the final exhortation and actually the farewell that the author pens in his conclusion to the letter. In verse 22 of Hebrews 13, look, just looking ahead, and I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in a few words. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free. Now we know that Paul wrote two letters to Timothy, who was the young pastor of the church at Ephesus. He stepped into Paul's shoes there and began to pastor what was a very difficult um, congregation to serve. So much so that it seems that he was at the point of quitting more than once. So Paul had to write and encourage him. So this writer of Hebrews has, understands who Timothy is. He knows Timothy enough to say, and he knows enough to say he's been set free. With whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. That to me sounds like the Apostle Paul yet again. And then he says in verse 24, greet all those who rule over you and all the saints, those from Italy greet you. Those from Italy greet you. We know from history, and it's recorded that Paul's final days were spent in Rome as a prisoner of the Praetorian Guard, the emperor's choice bodyguards, if you like. Uh, they were entrusted with the emperor's protection. And we know Paul was bound by them. And, and then tradition, history says that Paul died at Rome. That, and I've been to Rome and I've been, stood in a church, they say, was built over the place where Paul was killed. And if I'm remembering correctly, he was beheaded for his faith. So this last reference, or these references to Timoth Timothy on the one hand, and the fact that the writer is writing or can send greetings from Italy, so presumably the letter is written in Italy and sent from Italy. And if it's at the end of Paul's life, if, if it's his final days, then he's just trying to put it all together. But I find in these strong clues that Paul was the mysterious author of the letter to the Hebrews. And then as we continue in the, letter, in the chapter itself in verse 1, and once again he lifts up Christ uh, to the highest place. 
For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. This is a prophetic connection from Psalm 2. And so once again, we see the writer's knowledge of the Old Testament. He's able to pull out prophecies concerning the coming Messiah and the fact that he will be the son of God. Now, that idea that God has a son, you can imagine that the Jewish people could not accept that at all. But the point is made, but it's picked up from Psalm 2 as a prophecy of a son that will come. And then as he continues, there are numerous prophetic connections, but I can't take the time and the time I have to list all of them for you. But these are all quotations from the Old Testament period. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And then in verse six, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So now the angels are gonna worship this Messiah figure. And in verse seven, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. This is from Psalm 45. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. I'm by the shore of the Sea of Galilee this morning. Jesus will have walked along these shorelines, crisscrossed them again and again, going from one community to the other. And of course, performing miracles and meeting all manner of people. Now this Psalm says that he will have oil of gladness above his fellows. That means that the joy of the Lord will be very much a part of who he is. Uh, greater than his companions. And Jesus offered us joy abundant. That's what he offered us. And how could he do that unless he himself had the oil of gladness and the anointing of God and was full of joy. I could hear his voice, his laughter echoing across the Sea of Galilee. I believe that's, that's the Jesus that I, I believe in. Now, as we, as we continue in this um, chapter one, as it concludes, we have yet another reference, this time from Psalm 110 in verse one. But to which of the angels has he, God the Father ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. All in the beginning of this letter to the Hebrews, the supremacy, the all sufficiency of Christ over all the Old Testament laws and traditions and then looking beyond the cross to his rightful place as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to uh, assume the throne of David and today sits at the right hand of God the Father until he comes again in power and glory. Stay tuned for more from Dr. John Tweedy after this break. Today in the Middle East, Israel stands alone as the only true democracy and free country in the region. Yet even free countries struggle with poverty and people in their society that fall through the cracks. This is especially true in Israel, as they are surrounded by enemies and must focus much of their budget on security. But you can make a difference. Your one-time donation of $20 or more can change a life. By giving today, you will help feed the elderly and Holocaust survivors, build bomb shelters in vulnerable communities, and help children in these areas go to school. We really wish to thank you for all your support in the past and say that it was very, very helpful for us. We see you as our partners and we wish that you continue uh, with your support of the Zero Children. When you call today with your one-time gift, as a thank you, you will receive the bi-monthly newspaper, Israel the Prophetic Connection, and the special documentary, Seven Amazing Prophecies Fulfilled. Call or write today. In the opening chapter of the book of Hebrews, the writer, in a sense, gives homage to the God of all creation. Listen to his words in, in verse 10. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. 
So the writer of Hebrews knows exactly who God is. He's the God of all creation. Do you not remember that Jesus, when he approached this holy city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, coming from the Mount of Olives and descending down the slopes of the Mount of Olives toward the holy city, the people praised him as the coming king, shouting, Hosanna. But the Pharisees, who were the enemies of Jesus, told him to rebuke those people. But his answer to them is found in Luke chapter 19 in verse 14. But he answered them and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. What was he saying? He was saying the creation has longed for this day and if they will not praise my coming, the creation itself will praise my coming. You know, we have the ability to hear, but animals hear much more than we do. And who knows if the creation can cry out and we simply can't hear it, but we can hear the leaves of the trees clap their hands. We can hear the birds sing. All created things made by God were for his praise, his honor, and his glory. And on that day, all prophetic roads led to the holy city of Jerusalem. But I'm going to the very last book of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, because we find there that all future roads lead to the holy city of Jerusalem. From this point on in human history, this city will be the epicenter of world events and prophetic happenings. Verse 15 of Revelation, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The book of Hebrews is yet another story of Jesus of Nazareth, coming in fulfillment of all the prophets had said, the one who would be the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And as we continue in this book, We'll unlock the secrets of the Bible. We will make the prophetic connections between what the prophets have said and what is happening on earth today and will happen on earth tomorrow. For many years now, Sefri America and our partners have been there for Israel especially during times of war and hardship. Because of this support, Israel's most vulnerable have been cared for by groups like the Jaffa Institute and others. The Jaffa Institute is an institute that deals with children at high risk in slum communities around Israel. Each year, organizations like the Jaffa Institute care for those in Israel who are unable to care for themselves. And this is all possible because of people like you. We'd like to thank C4I and all the partners around the world for their support and love and blessing on the Jaffa Institute. With your monthly support of $20 or more, you are making a real difference in the lives of Israel's most needy. And when you become a monthly supporter, you will receive the bi-monthly newspaper, Israel the Prophetic Connection. And while supplies last, the 13-part DVD set of the powerful series, Messiah. Call the number on your screen now and become a monthly partner today.